and welcome to Learning from Nature with me, your host, Lily Ehrman. I'm so excited to share this episode with you. Of course, I love every interview, but this might be one of my favorites. When Dr. John Warner gave a talk at Bioneers about 10 years ago, it sparked my interest in biomimicry. It's where my journey in this field started. So this is a full circle moment, and I even have the opportunity to thank him in our discussion. I am honored and grateful to be here and bring you all in for a really wonderful conversation. If you're one of the many people who are afraid of or avoid chemistry, I hope this ignites a new interest because chemistry is all around us and it's beautiful and it's elegant. John Warner is one of the founders of the field of green chemistry. He wrote the book that provides the definition and 12 principles of green chemistry with Paul Anastas in 1998. As an industrial chemist, he has over 330 patents and has worked with hundreds of companies worldwide. He received the Perkin Medal in 2014 from the Society of Industrial Chemistry. As an academic, he was a tenured full professor of chemistry and a tenured full professor of plastics engineering at the University of Massachusetts, where he started the world's first PhD program in green chemistry. He has over 120 publications in synthetic methodologies, non-covalent derivatization, polymer photochemistry, metal oxide semiconductors, and green chemistry. In 2022, he received the August Wilhelm von Hoffmann Medal from the German Chemical Society, and in 2004, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring from the U.S. National Science Foundation and President George W. Bush. As an inventor, John's inventions have led to the founding of many companies in the field of photovoltaics, neurochemistry, construction materials, and cosmetics. In 2016, he received the Lemelson Invention Ambassadorship from the Lemelson Foundation and the American Association for the Advancement of the Sciences. John is a member of the Club of Rome, Distinguished Professor of Green Chemistry at Monash University in Australia, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at Chula Longkorn University in Thailand, and Honorary Professor of Chemistry at the Technical University of Berlin, where they have named the John Warner Center for Startups in Green Chemistry. A note for listeners. This is a longer conversation, but like always, I had a really hard time cutting it down. So I recommend tuning in and taking breaks, going to lay in the forest for a while, and coming back when you're ready. There's so much good information and inspiration here. Okay, I won't make you wait any longer. Let's jump on in. I'm John Warner. I'm considered one of the founders of green chemistry and I consider myself first and foremost a chemistry inventor helping to invent technologies that are consistent with the principles of green chemistry. And you just mentioned that you are known as one of the founders of green chemistry. What is that? There's so many different ways to introduce the concept of green chemistry. I find the best way is open up the newspaper, turn on the radio, look on the internet. We hear about some red dye in cosmetics that causes cancer or an additive in plastics that causes birth defects or components that are getting into the atmosphere causing global climate change. And really scary bad news. And Mm -hmm. people say, well, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to invent this? But the most important question people don't ask themselves is, why? why? Why would a chemist invent a material that is carcinogenic, causes birth defects, and contributes to global climate change? If we assume no one wants to do that, then why do they? And so really, instead of looking at how we make chemistry and molecules, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, how do we make chemists? And what you'll find is worldwide, Every chemistry program on the planet, if you look at the courses that the students have to take, the lessons that they take, the examinations to become uh, allowed, if you will, to go out into society and invent the future, you will find almost no university on the planet teaches, let alone requires, any chemist to understand how to anticipate the negative implications of what they make on human health or the environment. So why do we have these difficult things? This isn't some epic battle of good and evil. For some strange, weird reason, the field of chemistry has evolved to not see that as self-definitional. 
So green chemistry is a chunk of science to insert into chemistry to bring it whole so that it does have this concept of let's make sure before we make a material, we actually have a skill set of how to anticipate the potential negative implications. Yeah. And I feel like we are seeing it more, at least in kind of the mainstream way, like if people think about all of these bioplastics, like how do we get out of, you know, the plastic issues that we're in right now with plastic, you know, decomposing over way too long of periods and having all of these chemicals that have effects on our bodies and the planet. And I think that's a really hot topic of conversation. Like how do we invent a material that can replace or perform better than plastic? And that all of this comes down to like, yeah, how do we do chemistry, which is Exactly. So and that's, important. <laughs> so, so the key is if, if you look at globally all the things that we're doing under the broad umbrella of sustainability, I would I would argue that most activities, whether it's the UN SDGs, the circular economy, or whatever other approach that people are taking, planetary boundaries, they describe a state that we wish our products we're in. Mm -hmm. But in a way, if you think about that, it's kind of like music appreciation, right? We could take a class to learn to distinguish between Bach, Beethoven, and Tchaikovsky. We could become quite expert in recognizing passages and explaining why this is classically a Tchaikovsky piece or something like that, and really master understanding the difference. But wheel out a piano and say, compose a piece of music. Mm -hmm. not the same thing. And so in a way, we have a lot of activity in sustainability appreciation yeah but the actual let's go in the lab and invent well that's the world of green chemistry and in my opinion we have far too little how do we do it we mm -hmm. telling everybody what we want to do and we the all the hoping and dreaming and an awareness in the world if we don't change the way we teach chemistry we can never get there yeah and bring people in rather than just try to cut them out, which is, I think is an exactly. important dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're hinting at this, but I'd like for you to kind of go into how does nature do chemistry? What, what makes it more elegant or efficient than how we currently do chemistry, quote unquote, do chemistry? <laughs> so, so it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I oftentimes will, you know, if you Google up, metabolism or metabolic chart or something like that, you will find these posters and you can go into a biochemistry or molecular biology or chemistry lab and you can see this huge chart on the wall and the font is really, really small. And you'll see this molecule, 2-hydroxy-5-methyl-2-phosphoro, two, two this gets transferred into this, into this. And you look at all these arrows and you look at that and you say, oh my God, that is nasty chemistry. Look at all these molecular transformations. Look at all these molecules. And then you step back and you realize that's what goes in the middle of a cell all the time. Mm -hmm. That biology has evolved over 3.8 billion years to do not hundreds, not thousands and thousands of chemical transformations. So the color red in a rose, a, uh, a, a wax on the leaf to make it more um, water resistant or whatever, everything that the human built, built world makes, there are molecules in nature. And what I don't think people fully appreciate, there are molecular transformations carried out in nature that are almost identical to the ones that we do in a factory with beakers and flasks. The only problem is the ones in the factories and the beakers and flasks were invented without the field of green chemistry. And because of that lack of awareness of the implications on human health and the environment, there is now, oh my God, there is natural chemistry and then there's synthetic human-made chemistry. And it is correct, it is nasty, in a lot of ways, but it doesn't have to be. I would argue that beakers and flasks that embrace green chemistry can be just as natural, just as safe, just as sustainable as something that's going in in the petal of a leaf or in the ear of a frog or whatever you want it to be. The chemistry doesn't know if it's in a cell or in a beaker. 
the yeah. human that's doing it, if they're not aware of green chemistry, can make really nasty stuff. It's the same thing with, you know, we could make a lotus leaf. We could say, wow, biomimicry. We know that a lotus leaf has really interesting properties. And we could make it with fluorinated nasty chemicals. It looks like nature, mm -hmm. but it ain't as sustainable as nature. Well, the same thing goes on in beakers and flasks. So right now we have a long way to go for green chemistry to catch up. But there is really no fundamental difference between synthesizing a molecule in a cell or synthesizing a molecule in a beaker. There's no fundamental law that says we can't do that sustainably. And in fact, a lot of times the extraction process, if someone goes and extracts the color red out of a rose petal, Sometimes they use pretty nasty solvents and yeah. pretty hazardous materials to do that. So it's not even given that if something's coming from biology, it has to, by definition, be safer, less toxic and more sustainable. In fact, sometimes it just simply isn't. So we, gotta, we need green chemistry to make sure that we're taking care of those implications too. And so for folks who don't really have any footing in the, the chemistry space, can you give an example maybe of like how a company or how, or how a product or process could be developed with green chemistry as opposed to regular chemistry? Well, essentially, the, the thing is, is there are 12 principles of green chemistry. And those 12 principles of green chemistry, it's, it's, it isn't really non-chemical speak. So I can't really talk about the 12 principles of green yeah, chemistry that's fair. in any reasonable way. I do give a lecture in which I do give an analogy so that, you know, comparing it to baking cakes and making bicycles and whatnot. But the 12 principles, they the intended audience is, remember, the people making the molecules that making the and inventing those technologies so it's not it's not designed for you know someone in a in a supermarket to be chatting to someone else and say hey uh, what do you think of principle number seven for this analytic <laughs> you know that's the, the idea is is that i feel there are so many people in society that uh that get it that are yeah. talking about it that are demanding it that are wanting it but green chemistry is really geared towards the people inventing so that they can provide us. And so, like I said, uh, uh, there are so many examples. If I you know, take any product that is right now on the market, I don't know, imagine a, a coating to make a jacket waterproof. Absent green chemistry, someone might take some fluorinated material like with PFAS or something and take that material, the, the textile and apply using some pretty harsh conditions, a fluorinated material that once it gets into the environment persists forever and you find it all over the earth because it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't degrade. Uh, that would be absent of green chemistry. Green chemistry would be, is there a material that is still giving the properties of water repellency works just as good and here's the most important part is also similar in cost because yeah. if the technology is way more expensive and only rich people can be safe and unrich people have to use the nasty that is just way yeah. not cool so realistically we need to make sure that these technologies work as good as the as the competing technology cost as good as the competing technology and oh by the way are better for human health and the environment and so you know every product that has a problem no matter how you want to assess it do you want to use the concepts of circular economy say gee this product is not consistent with the circular economy you want to use the un sdgs hey this isn't consistent with the un sdgs you want to take a cradle to cradle assessment hey this isn't really that good for cradle to cradle mm -hmm. you use green chemistry to improve the technology then you carry out that assessment again and hopefully you've done a better job so green chemistry isn't the mechanism to assess green chemistry is the mechanism to invent. Yeah, I love that. And 
we mentioned this earlier and I'll just emphasize it again because I think it is really important. Folks get really excited about biomimicry and that's kind of the main audience for this podcast. But when you start actually prototyping and designing and thinking through not only how to imitate nature and, and translate those strategies to a design, but how do you build it? How do you make it? How do you like create it? Yeah. You, and so then, you can choose like either is it going to be a material that is sustainable and regenerative and, you know, life friendly, or is it a conventional material that's, you know, maybe easier to integrate into the market, but not actually sustainable at all. And that is this green chemistry conversation that needs to happen at exactly. kind of behind the scenes of biomimicry. Right. And so the way I look at it is if I, if I approach a problem and again, I've got, I think at last count, 341 patents. I've spun out seven companies of licensed technologies to over 25 multinationals. This is you know something that inventing stuff is that it, that is consistent with the 12 principles of green chemistry is what I do. And I would say that biomimicry almost always plays an important role in my invention process and you know so so what i do how bio i don't i i do it a little different than what the traditional you know view of biomimicry is what i do is is i trust my molecular intuition if i need to create a let's say an oxygen barrier for a package i will use my molecular intuition to say, okay, I need a molecule kind of like this. I need a molecule kind of like this. I need to make this kind of thing. I got to do this. And I think in my mind about a couple different approaches at the molecular level that my chemistry intuition says will work. Then I look to nature to how does nature work with those types of materials so that it's not just the noun, but it's the verb mm -hmm. because, again, we have a lot of regulatory processes in place that the product that the customer, the consumer is touching has so much more scrutiny than the people in the factory or the people wherever it's being extracted from nature or at end of life where it's going. And so green chemistry isn't just about the interaction between the 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 person using the product, but it's going all the way back to where did it come from? Are there, you know, social justice issues? How are these things being created? Mm -hmm. You know, what is the process in the manufacturing? What are the solvents and the reagents there? And at the end of life, what's going to happen to it? Is it going? And so it's, it's a lot of work. It's really hard. It's going to take decades and decades to make significant progress, but it's happening. And it's exciting. And so biomimicry is an excellent tool to help green chemistry. Yeah, they, they definitely go hand in hand. And, and folks who are just starting their biomimicry journey, I mean, obviously there's, there's so much to explore and get excited about. Mm -hmm. But something I like to emphasize when we have a deeper relationship with nature and go out into nature and be curious so that we can learn from nature is not being afraid of the chemistry questions, right? Like how does this leaf, you know, create this really interesting material that's water repellent and protects from UV light and, you know, has all these functions and the, the, this whole series is kind of about functions. Yeah. And this is a, a broader episode, I think, of just like chemistry in general, because so many people get stumped at that stage of like, oh, I actually don't know any chemistry. So I, I can't be curious about this. And but so it, it's, it's, yeah. Oh, go it's, ahead. It's, it's it's interesting because if you take any product, let's take, I don't know, a uh, 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 a jacket. Okay, you get some coat, some kind of jacket, and then you take a leaf, and you look at these two. Well, they clearly look very different. Well, if you mm -hmm. magnify them, and they you get to okay, one is a polyester, and one is you know got cellulose and protein, and then you magnify it more, and you get to oh, well, this has a carbon carbon hydrogen bond. This has a at some level they're indistinguishable. Hmm. 
and you can't tell the difference between biology and human built world is at a scale that we experience but once you get closer and you look at the carbon 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 hydrogen hydrogen oxygen all those uh, you know molecular level things you know nature is somewhat indistinguishable that some of the elements that nature doesn't use that humans do are problematic sometimes but chemistry the the ubiquity of chemistry is kind of beautiful because yeah. and 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 that's the thing that i think people don't fully appreciate is that you know there are cells that are beautiful and there are cells that can make us very sick and kill us. Mm -hmm. There are chemicals that are really cool and safe and nice. And there are chemicals that are really bad and can make us sick and hurt the environment. You know, it's is in the, the knowledge and awareness of, you know, how to distinguish between the two is critical. And that just so beautifully emphasizes that we are nature. There's not this yes. distinction. We're not this separate creature we are yeah. in relation and direct <laughs> directly related to nature like we are nature exactly. and i think that yeah if you look close enough it's it's all the same molecules it's just how do we yeah. design in a way that's in tune with these organisms that have been doing it much 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 longer than us you know so it's it's, it's interesting i have this diagram in which you know I, I i i have this almost like a funnel that goes you know imagine a big circle that is nature Right. And inside that circle, there is a tube, if you will. And on one end is a funnel that directly interfaces with nature. And what we do is that has natural resources that gets converted to raw materials. And then those raw materials, through the process of synthesis, undergoes chemical reactions, and then those things get assembled to products. Now, if you think about it, that you know, imagine that being like a sock. <laughs> I guess I just use the word of the sock. The end of the sock on one end allows nature in and nature out, but you go to the end and at the toe of the sock, you have products. Now, like most socks, there's porosity in that sock. In an ideal circular world everything stays within that stock makes a yeah. product and does a reverse journey back into nature to release those things now unfortunately at this present stage we can't come anywhere close to that and so we have either products that persist and don't return to nature or every step in the way there's stuff leaking out into nature but what is so so important is I can put a frog in nature. I can put a tree in nature. I can put, you know, a, a mushroom in nature. But I also got to put people in nature. I think sometimes yeah. people want, someone, some, some, some of us want to put people in the sock and they forget. No, in, in the very language of, I want to, green chemistry addresses impact on human health and the environment those words imply that there's a difference and yeah. that sometimes gets in our way because we humans are in the environment the environment is us and when we put ourselves away from it in a way i think that causes more problems than it, than it helps yeah and to some degree that separation is kind of what got us into some of the challenges mm -hmm. we're facing today yeah. and it's yeah. almost like a bit of a full circle moment right like us and as I say us as like, you know, humans on, yeah. on planet Earth, having mm -hmm. an intention to return to listening and learning from nature as mm -hmm. a guide. And, you know, that's all of the stuff we're using to make it is at the end of the day, also nature because it's on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that's an interesting thought experiment because it's 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 a reminder, right, that we are connected to the planet. And that's where I want folks to recognize that chemistry is beautiful and all around us. And we are chemistry. Nature yeah, is chemistry. Exactly. And, and that when we talk about chemical products, again, in a perfect world, as if perfection is something that's attainable, um, but you know what I mean? In a, in, <laughs> in, a, in a world that we want to achieve, it shouldn't matter 
where the molecules come from and where the molecules go as, the, as long as they're consistent and supportive of natural ecosystems. And so, so I would argue that petroleum products are not because they do not reverse degrade back into life supportive materials and they're depleting and they create all kinds of other issues. But he has an interesting thought. This is, this is an interesting thought. A lot of people glorify the petroleum industry. They say, look at the medicines, look at the textiles, look at the electronics, look at it. So inexpensive. It is so, you know, ubiquitous in our society. How will we ever replace what people don't fully appreciate? Here is my perhaps controversial statement. If you could go back in time, and stop Jed Clampett from when he was shooting at some food up from the ground come bubbling crude. Just imagine we never invented petroleum. We never discovered petroleum. I would argue everything we have today would have been invented with other materials. There's nothing magical. The reason everything is petroleum is because more than any other material in the history of humanity, the petroleum industry has been so heavily subsidized And that since the 30s and 40s, so much government funding has gone to support research, to support development, to support extraction. If you took any other material, cellulose, whatever, Mm -hmm. and you applied that kind of resources to it, it would be just as cost effective and just as ubiquitous. And so I'm not making this as some kind of vilification of political processes. I'm using this as a ray of hope that there is nothing magic about petroleum. We humans did create a very cost effective economy on petroleum. We could do it with anything else if we wanted to. This isn't a crisis of, you know, now we have the tools. It's do we have the will? Yeah. And that leads to this big question that I think we've been kind of hinting at, but why is green chemistry important? And I I see it obviously as a key element to this pathway for our future. And maybe you can kind of highlight a a, a specific reason, like why is this field important in that future? Well, again, I, 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 that question kind of pushes me back a little bit because again we could have a whole bunch of people having meetings saying we want good products we want good products we could go to the whiteboard and we could describe what a good product is we could look in nature and say wouldn't it be nice if this is this wouldn't it be nice if this is this mm-hmm. and we could all describe what we wish the world was but ultimately it has to be invented by a chemist yeah. And if that chemist doesn't know green chemistry, they can't. It's as simple as that. It's not a mm-hmm. nice to have. It is literally a requirement that if we don't do green chemistry, then we're going to, like I said, have things that look like a gecko, but made out of, of PFAS. Yeah. And, and so we need to have, and so I like to use as an example I, my 11-year-old daughter, Natalie, she speaks perfect English. She can read. She can write. She's, you know, amazing, like, like all fathers do, <laughs> of course. But it's interesting. A couple of years ago, she started taking, you know, classes on nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs. And you say to yourself, well, well wait a minute. She's already reading. She's already writing. She's, you know. Fine. Well, why, why does she even need to know what a noun is and a verb is? But I would argue that she's really getting by aping her environment, her parents, poor kid and whatnot, that she's, <laughs> she's getting by. But when she learns the parts of speech and she learns sentence structure, she'll be operating at an infinitely higher level, not just how she's communicating to the outside world, but how she's shaping and framing her own thoughts. I would argue the the design community is very much like my 11-year-old daughter when it comes to sustainability. Mm. We wake up in the morning and say, gee, I don't want to die in the lab today. You know, smart companies figured out if you make your customers sick, that's bad for sales. So forever we've wanted to make sustainable stuff, but what we haven't had 
is that sentence structure of sustainability, the nouns and the verbs, if you will, of how to invent the technologies to be, you know, less impactful on yeah. human health and the environment. And that sentence structure, those nouns and verbs are the 12 principles of green chemistry. And so yeah. I would argue that people have been well-intended since the beginning of time. I doubt anyone has ever gone in the lab and said, what is the most toxic way I can make this product? Assuming people kind of get it and they don't want to hurt people. Right. If it was that easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Yeah. But it's so it's it people think it's a crisis of desire. If we just yell loud enough or, or maybe let's ban products or let's have regulations that doesn't tell you how to do it. All the pressure in the world to insist on something isn't going to enable people to do it. And so essentially the day every university requires a chemist to have some working knowledge of green chemistry before they're sent off to the world to invent. Until that day happens, those chemists will most likely be going off inventing the stuff that we're going to have to pick up later. And that's just mind blowing to me. And, and we talked about this earlier before I was recording, but that almost 10 years ago when I heard you talk and you were you know, explaining how not many universities require this, mm -hmm. it's shocking. And that we've gotten so far in academia and these chemists who've taken all of these, you know, incredibly difficult classes to understand this, um, mm -hmm. this field. And they don't, they don't have to have any toxicology or even, yeah, like yep. anatomy so even. Two, con two concepts. So, and, and again, if we add everything and we say, oh, gee, everyone should know any everything. They should have morals and ethics and economy and this and that before too long to get a degree would take right. two years and the people What's be What's the dead. minimum? What's the bare minimum? Uh, <laughs> and, and so we got to be careful. To, you know, the enemy of the excellent is the perfect. And so there's nice to have and there's required to have. And, you know, it, um, imagine if I said to you, I'm going to bake a cake, all right? I bake cakes for a living and they are delicious and people really love them. But every once in a while, people get sick and die. But that's okay. There are other people <laughs> who worry about that. Well, I, I, I build houses. I'm an architect and man, they're beautiful houses. Every once in a while, they fall down and kill the people inside it. But there are other people who think about that. That's absurd. Yeah. And yet that is exactly how we treat chemistry, as if it's some special part of chemistry that worries about hurting people, but the bulk doesn't care. It's amazing. But 10 years ago, in, well, in 2007, Amy Cannon started Beyond Benign. It's a nonprofit organization that's working on green chemistry education for K-12 and for university. And 10 years ago, she started what's called the Green Chemistry Commitment, where we ask chemistry departments to sign a commitment saying somehow they're going to get into the required curriculum of working knowledge of the principles of green chemistry. Mm -hmm. She has now over 127 universities worldwide who have signed that commitment. Every week now, Amazing. more and more universities, uh, uh, you know, and so universities in Vienna, Stockholm University, Chulalongkorn in Thailand, Monash in Australia, you know, there's, it's, it's, you know, the book Green Chemistry Theory and Practice is 25 years old this year. It takes a while for these revolutions to take place, but I am so optimistic because yeah. of the work of Beyond Benign. Because again, it isn't it, it isn't an issue of industry or economy or policy. It is a fundamental self de definitional perspective of chemistry. If you imagine that I take a group of third graders or CEOs of companies, PhD chemists, take any population, any group of people, and I hold the container in front of that group. I go, go back to your earliest classes. Let's just, you know, make a list. Well, let's describe this stuff I'm holding. Someone's going to say solid liquid gas. Someone might say it boils at 100 degrees. It freezes at zero. It's transparent. It's colorless. It's flexible. It's got this viscosity. I'm going to rattle off all these things that define this stuff. But any group, it's 
probably unlikely that anyone says, well, what about its impact on human health? What about its impact on the environment? For some reason, our relationship to materials has evolved to not include that. And it's kind of like, you got to scratch your head. What, what, why, why not? And so this is an aberration in history. And so if we can return those properties, toxicity, environment, into what, it, what the, the definition of what a material is, then who would ever consider inventing something that's toxic and hurts the environment? Right now, the very fact that it's not in the field of chemistry is what causes it. Yeah. And that, on one hand, it like gives me hope that there's these universities really making this commitment. And I remember you talking about Beyond Benign and I've been following them and it's, it's such important work. But even on the other end of that, you know, spectrum of folks who've already gone through chemistry, they've been in the field for 40 years. How yeah. do we get them thinking about this? Like we have so it's, this kind it's, of spectrum it's, of folks. So it's, it's, it's really cool. You know, the, there are, Green chemistry came out, like I said, over 25 years ago. Industry, many companies immediately got it, Hmm. all right? Many companies, you know, have vice presidents of green chemistry. They have green chemistry programs. It's it's interesting because, again, remember my definition, better performance, better cost. Oh, by the way, it does. It has these sustainability attributes. Who wouldn't want it? And so industry in Europe, sadly, not in the United States, but in Europe, this, you know, U.S. has its trade association. And Europe has its trade association. In Europe, I am asked almost four or five times a year to have workshops for industry to train them in the principles of green chemistry and how to use that in invention. And so it's funny to me, I have seen industry is saying, oh my God, this is going to help our bottom line. This is going to get us fast at a market. But they look at the people working for them And they say, but our people don't know how. And so interestingly enough, industry is actually ahead of academia. If you look at a textbook in chemistry from the 1980s and you look at a chemistry textbook now, you'd be hard pressed to identify any difference. The field of chemistry has evolved dramatically, but how we teach it hasn't. And so interestingly enough, academia is way behind industry when it comes to this. But industry isn't in the business of teaching its people. They're already hiring people that are already fully trained. So when academia catches up, I really, I see all kinds of signs that they are. You know, there are, like I said, 127 signers globally now. These universities get it. They, They realize that the world needs this. Now, sadly... Right now, to publish a paper in a journal, you don't need green chemistry. If it's just an article that no one's ever going to read or do anything with, who cares if it's toxic? Mm-hmm. Sadly, that's most most academic publications never get read, let alone reproduced. Um, and so, unfortunately, they have a different measure of success. Yeah. And but the next generation of students, they they do care. They're saying, but wait a minute. That's that's not what I want to do. I want to I want to have a positive impact in society, and I don't measure that by what journal I published in. I measure it by did I solve a problem? Imagine a twenty mm-hmm. one year old person working in a lab, pouring beakers and flasks. All right, and if they get it right, he or she will have an impact where hundreds of thousands of people might not be exposed to some carcinogen because they figured out a better way. What could be more impactful or powerful uh, of something to do- dedicate one's career to? But you can't do it just by wanting. You got need the you need the skills. Yeah. And that that gives me hope that you know there's yeah. there's folks excited about this and there's better ways to do it. It's Absolutely. just really hopeful. It, I, me too. I'm super optimistic. So this kind of leads me to this bigger question, this more broad question of like, where do we see, where do you see green chemistry in the materials industry, in the manufacturing industry in the next decade or so? Like where, where is it taking us? Is it, I mean, we've kind of talked like it's gained traction, but now, now what? 
So again, it's 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 starting to to get its way in. Again, sadly, our investment community is not terribly sufficient. When you look at how materials come into play, the investment community hasn't changed all that much. The mm-hmm. fact that they accept a five percent success rate and will brag that they lay bets and most of those bets will end up failing. It's really kind of sad that that we we don't do a better job with due diligence looking at not just the market, not just the four minute, three minute, two minute elevator pitch, but getting deeper into the discussion of can this stuff actually really work? Right now, the elevator pitch actually forces individuals to fake it till you make it. Yeah, and so we've got. I, I would argue we have plenty of investment capital to solve most of society's problems, but it's not being deployed well because we accept this one in 10. It's all about the return and the fake it till you make it. And it's not into that deep substance. Can we really do it? And, you know, maybe an, an investment firm wants you to calculate how many tons of CO2 will be removed. Mm. But they won't really dive deep into, well, is your technology sound? Will it actually work? And so society is inundated with these press releases. You know, this group here has solved this problem. This group here has solved this problem. And so it's almost, it almost feels like problems have been solved. What's the big deal? Why aren't we using all these? But then when you drill down, it's like 22 milligrams on a microscope slide for $60,000. Well, you know, mm. there's a long way. And, and we have this belief that that first invention is 90% of the problem and the rest is just grunt work. And unfortunately, it is just as beautiful, just as elegant, just as challenging, perhaps more so, to take that 62 milligrams on a microscope slide and turn it into a manufacturing process. But no one's attention is on that. We're looking at the next press release of the next 62 milligrams, and we're forgetting. Yep. There's a big, and so we really need to focus on that aspect. And yes, the 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 new wonderful cool ideas are important. But we're not spending enough time with the inelegant, nobody gets celebrated for taking the thing to scale. And so that's why I, I, you know, a full tenured professor of chemistry, full tenured professor of plastics engineering, and I resigned. Who does that? (laughs) I'm full tenured professorships so that I could focus my energy on translation if it doesn't make it to a product it's you know we're, we're in trouble and so unfortunately society isn't all that interested in that work but it we, we've got to be and so if that's yeah. where we need to start celebrating the practicalization of these things not just the 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 yes we need inspiration yes we need aspirational cool stuff But at the end of the day, we also need to translate. But what happens is we hear all of a sudden shovel ready. That doesn't mean let's only invest in things that are ready today, because that means we're only investing in the things that are already invented. So there's this gap. People Mm -hmm. invest in things that are ready to deploy today, or they'll invest in cool aspirational things. But where is that space in between? And that's where, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of company and I, and I spend most of my time, you know, doing that. And it's, it's not the cool stuff, but man, is it important? Yeah. And it's because it's not as flashy. It doesn't get as much attention or as much funding. Publish it in high impact factory journals. You know, so everyone's moving on to the next flashy thing and it's it's sad. I need to to test this out. And that. It's interesting also because I like it's extra cool that you have this perspective from both sides almost, right? The invention, prototype, building it, get to market side and the academic side. Mm-hmm. And just being in academia for a few years, like <laughs> I can understand yeah. that that side of things at least a little bit. Um, but digging a little deeper into that question of like, is it can we get to the point where investors and venture capital supports, because this is a big thing in biomimicry too, like in, in any, any design space, but biomimicry specifically, because it's gaining traction. There are some hot headlines every now and then of some cool design, but then where's so, the funding to actually build I'm going to be heretical. 
I'm going to be heretical on you here. <laughs> but here's the problem. You know, we have gotten some type of amnesia about how the human built world came about. We have this myth of the inventor. We have these design charrettes. Everybody sits in a room. Yeah. We want it to be this color. We want it to be this flexible. And we draw this Venn diagram. And what ends up happening is everyone's very excited if it did this, 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 this. Oh, my God. But from a technical scientific perspective, that overlap and that Venn diagram becomes literally impossible or so impossible that it can't be invented. And the interesting thing is that that's not how the world evolved. Mm. Interestingly enough, if you go back 40, 50, 60 years, what probably happened is two old white men with cigars hanging out of their mouth met at a golf course and one said to the other, I got tanker trucks of this stuff. I don't know what to do with it. And the other said, I'll make a spoon. Now, they didn't say, how do I make a spoon? They said, how do I sell the stuff? Right. Whether it was polystyrene, polyethylene, polypropylene, the world evolved because of the availability of the stuff. It didn't happen the other way. And so now we forgot that and we say, how can I make a jacket that repels water, that does this, what does this? What we need to do is we need to say, okay, what materials are truly sustainable. What have embraced biomimicry and green chemistry, a supportive of life principles, now get designers, sit them in the room and say, make some products out of this. Mm -hmm. Instead of asking for materials that are impossible, yes. start with the materials that are actually possible and use biomimicry to design products with the stuff that's available today. Now, there's a lot of gaps. There's still a lot of things we haven't invented yet, but man, there's a lot that we have. Yeah. I would love to have the opportunities one day to just look at what's already on the market. What have people come up with and say, okay, what products can we make with this? But we, we're doing it the wrong way. We're starting with defining the perfect product and going like hunter-gatherers, trying to yeah. find molecules and materials that do it. It's not the way it ever happened in mm -hmm. our life. It's always been, what do I do with this stuff? And it's a, honestly a little bit more of the like egotistical, I created this new fancy yep. thing and I want to make it a reality rather than what is yep. a reality that I can create with. <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and so start true. with what can happen. Yeah. And then that, interestingly enough, the 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 holes in that description will then inform where we should be spending more time inventing hmm. you know and so that yeah. exercise i i feel that it would be and, and so essentially that's kind of what i spend my time doing is i go in the lab i take materials and i reduce them to practice i say okay i'm going to make a textile that you know repels water i'm going to you know make a a, a material that is for a, a oxygen barrier for a coffee cup or i'm going to and, and and actually do the inelegant work of taking a material that exists and turning it into a product so that we can poke at it squeeze it and do all different yeah. things to it to figure out what do we need to do to get this to the finish line if all we do is define the finish line and the next person comes to define a new finish line and someone else, well, who's going to run the race? And this is where we, we, we need to focus more time and effort and resources. Exactly. Um, Ooh, yeah. it got, it's got me thinking <laughs> lots of, lots of <laughs> topics. I, I guess something I want to, I want to ask is for folks who don't have the chemistry background, the classical chemistry background, the, the basic mm -hmm. understanding and are wanting to do biomimicry or bring in these kind of conversations, like where do you, do you have recommendations for where to start or who yeah. to talk to or what like resources to share? So beyondbenign.org, beyondbenign.org, beyondbenign.org. <laughs> um, so, so it, ha it, it, a small, tiny set of individuals, a nonprofit that has generated almost three 
hundred lesson plans that wow. they're not in EDF, they're open access, there's no profit going on. They're not even they're not even in PDF. They're in Word so that people can modify it and use it. So, you know, so that you know, third grade teachers are saying, gee, how can I take, you know, I'm 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 talking about solids, liquids, and gases. How can I bring in sustainability and green chemistry or you know, further along, I'm working on, you know, polymers, how does that work? And so it is just a treasure trove of things to search through and dive through and things like that. And so, you know, Beyond Benign is, is in my opinion, the best first stop to someone who's who wants to get into it. And yes, it doesn't require you to go back to school and learn chemistry. All it, it requires you to do is to try to lose the inhibition of being able to talk to a chemist and mm. and if you have a chemist that is dropping jargon and using acronyms and <laughs> words that you don't understand don't ask them to change find another chemist because they probably <laughs> don't actually understand it themselves yeah. if they can't explain it to you in a way that you don't need a chemistry degree be suspicious that that chemist probably doesn't really know what they're talking about <laughs> A good tip. Yeah. That, and I can also attest to the Beyond Benign lesson plans. I've used a few of those and they are just amazing. It's a great way to get folks thinking about chemistry. And I think that the important nugget here is it's almost like a new perspective from which to see mm -hmm. the world. At least it was for me. Like when you spoke at Bioneers, it really sparked, honestly, my whole interest in biomimicry. So I have you to thank for that. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Thank and you. On, a, a deeper perspective of, okay, even beyond just learning from nature, like this appreciation and admiration for how nature works. It's beautiful. Yes. And, and again, it's, it's, it's interesting. I know we only have a little bit more time, but, you know, people talk about chemistry being the central science or biology being central. So that the way I look at it, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I look at it as if chemistry creates biology, yeah. biology creates, um, let's call it um, neuro neuroscience. Neuroscience leads to philosophy. Philosophy leads to mathematics. Mathematics leads to physics. And physics leads to chemistry. We are all on a perpetual circle in which nothing's in the center, nothing's in the middle. It all merges together. And heaven forbid we embrace the academic model of creating silos. Mm. You're a biologist. You're a physicist. You're, there is nowhere in nature that any definitions like that happen. In fact, most important thing to remember about nature, there are no committees in yeah. nature, right? If there was a committee that evolved de design plans, it would have looked at the giraffe and said, oh, that's silly, it won't work. The giraffe happened because there was no committee to stop it, all right? And yeah. so we really, as we look at how we invest, how we make things, we've got to find a way to, to, to stop the over-evaluation of people's plans that pushes innovation down to the bottom. So if we're really going to do biomimicry, it's not just in the molecules. It's not just in the products. It's in the processes. Yeah. And I don't think we're spending enough time looking at how decisions are made. And that's where working with indigenous cultures and working with 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 people who didn't create peer review and just have a, an yeah. inner sense of what makes sense and what is right and what is wrong. We have so much to learn. I love that perspective. That's really important. And so... I want to end with what is giving you hope and joy right now? The next generation, like I said, last week I spent the American Chemical Society had a summer school in um, um, Golden, Colorado, where there was some 70 graduate student postdocs from all of the Western Hemisphere, from you know South America, Latin America, North America, and to see the passion in, in these people to see in their eyes, you know, that when it, they are passionate to learn green chemistry and they will not, not do green chemistry. So it doesn't matter. Do they go to work for mm. a company that wants to do green chemistry? It's the wrong perspective. These people will not not do green chemistry. And as more and more of the next generation are appropriately trained, 
they'll have it no other way. And so people ask me sometimes, you know, should we work on solvents? Should we work on polymers? Should we work on energy? Should we work on what should we be working on? I say, no, who's so presumptuous to pick which one we should work on? If we change the way we train people in chemistry and we give everybody the tools, trust them to do the right thing on everything they do. That's what gives me the op optimism is that I just believe that the next generation desperately wants to do it. The crisis right now is, do we have the, the ability and the resources to give them the tools? Because like I said, 127 schools sounds like a lot to sign the Green Chemistry Commitment, but that's like what? two, three percent of the yeah. global population <laughs> of universities. We've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But it's happening. It's happening. Thank you, John. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for continuing to support this podcast. I'll leave you with this quote from Paul Anastas in the Chemical Industry Journal. The biggest accomplishment of green chemistry is changing the way people think to know what's possible to actually make sustainability into a practical reality rather than just a slogan.